Chapter 6 Sandy spent the next day at home trying to reach her mother with no success. She finally resorted to calling the old woman that lived across the street from her parents, Mrs. Rabidas. Although cordial with her, she was known as a neighborhood busybody. At least she would be able to let Sandy know if her folks were home. It only took Sandy half an hour to get through to Mrs. Rabidas, who was happy to tell Sandy everything she knew. Mrs. Rabidas launched into a one-sided conversation as soon as she knew it was Sandy. You know, dear, they came about 4 a.m. and took your father and mother in a van. I don't know what they must have been up to. Did your father own guns? They must have been looking for guns or drugs. Anyway, the police took them away. They broke the door down, dear. The house is wide open. Oh, they'll lose all their heating oil if the heat's on. Do you want me to turn it off? I, I really shouldn't be seen over there if they are terrorists, dear, but I'll do it this once. But when will they be home? Do you know? Oh, this is awful. What could your father have done? Maybe I shouldn't talk to you. I bet they're listening. Sandy, you need to get your parents a good lawyer. Why did you move away? Your mother misses you so. Well, dear, I'm going to go. I don't want to miss days of our lives. And with that, she hung up. Sandy hung up, having not been allowed one word during Mrs. Robita's rave. Sandy called Dave on the two-meter radio and let him know what had happened to her parents. Dave told Steve, and they both drove to Dave's house. We've got to get my parents out of jail, said Sandy, her eyes red with tears. We don't even know when they are going to be released, or even with what they are being charged, reasoned Dave. He had a feeling he was going to lose this one no matter how much sense he made. I don't care. Those are my parents, and this is still America. Well, said Steve, this is still America, but down there it isn't, Sandy. Things have changed. I do not care, stated Sandy deliberately. Dave, you and the guys do all that commandos training out at Steve's place. Can't you rescue them? Sandy, a raid into a place like that with no support, we'd all die. You know I'd do it if I thought we even had a slim chance of pulling it off. We'll come up with something, I promise you. Steve, I want to meet with a group at Jim's place. Can you help me round them up? Sure, we'll stay on two meters and I'll see what I can do. They met in Jim's barn. Jim didn't use it for anything other than storage, so he and the others had fixed up a large corner of it as a meeting room. They often met there for classroom training or just to hang out in BS. The wives of the men called it the clubhouse. <clears throat> the discussion about what Dave should do was animated and lively. Some suggested he write off his in-laws. Others suggested raiding a prison. And one even half-jokingly suggested that Dave head out alone to find them, stay at his place for a day or two, and then tell Sandy he couldn't find them. Dave finally decided he would go down there before Sandy took care of it herself. They discussed how he could do it. He still had his license plates from Connecticut, and he had not removed his state inspection sticker. He decided to put those plates on his car. Jim's brother, Gene, made him a very close copy of a real registration certificate. He would hide his New Hampshire plates and registration behind a body panel, and replaced them in, in his in-law's garage, then used that on the way home. He decided not to carry any firearms. This was a soft recon, and if he was stopped with an M4 and 15 30-round mags, it would take a lot of explaining. After some discussion, he adopted the suggestion that he dress as he had been hiking. That would allow him to explain his bug-out bag. If questioned, he could say he had been hiking in the White Mountains. It was an iffy excuse, especially given the gas restrictions, but there was still limited tourism, mostly by people who had means to purchase black market gasoline. It was the best he could come up with. They arranged daily radio contact and prearranged signals to let him know if the situation in New Hampshire had changed. They also vowed, over Dave's pro protestations, to come get him if he was hurt, <coughs> wounded, or in other danger. As the meeting broke up, Bill, who lived 20 miles north of Dave in Connecticut, handed him a note as he shook his hand. Dave read it later. All that was printed on it was, Under My Grill. Dave destroyed the note after reading it. After filling his wife's car with gas, <clears throat> Dave went home and began packing his backpack. He wanted enough gear to bug out, but did not want to draw attention to himself. The pack itself was a forest green Kelty internal frame. It was expedition size, around 6,500 cubic inches. 
Dave tried not to overload it, but liked the flexibility the larger pack gave him. The pack itself had integral side pockets. <coughs> Into the left, Dave put a lightweight camouflaged USGI poncho and six green bungee cords. Also in the pocket was a roll of 550 cord, GI duct tape wrapped around a Callum light stick, and a heavy green space blanket. In the other pocket, he put a black knit watch cap, a pair of GI leather gloves with wool liners, and a pair of green aviator flight gloves, his expedient antenna, spare AA batteries, his folded up GI boonie hat with its camo cover, two locking carabiners, and a small bottle of water purification tablets. The main compartment was accessible by a zippered flap, and in this flap itself was a flat pocket. Dave kept his waterproof maps in there, along with a spare compass and an alcohol pen set and a small New Testament. In the main body of the pouch, he put food, his water bladder, a pair of OD jungle fatigues, four pair of GI wool socks, four pair of polypro sock liners, foot powder, a Katydin water filter, an extra rubberized poncho, German surplus, more 550 cord, his two meter handheld, his wind up radio, a small solar battery charger, two t-shirts, a flannel shirt, and a small personal hygiene kit with toothpaste, toothbrush, medicine, band-aids and gauze, sewing kit, nail clippers, soap and a face cloth, and a small packet of baby wipes. In the top pocket, he kept a small LED flashlight, toilet paper, and an OD green handkerchief. He attached a GI butt pack to the outside compression strap of the pack. <clears throat> In that, he carried a space blanket, a change of socks, one MRE, an S-bit stove full of fuel along with a disposable lighter. Attached to the butt pack was a length of 550 cord so he could detach it and use it as a shoulder bag. Under the butt pack, <clears throat> in a bag made for a mop suit, he carried a lightweight Gore-Tex rain suit in black. On the waist belt, he carried a GI canteen and cover set with a metal canteen cup. On his left hip was a black accessory pouch from a commercial gear maker that carried a small mirror, a Leatherman tool, a lighter, bug repellent, metal spoon, a sharpening steel, his old GI tritium compass, two heat tabs, a film container of cotton ball soaked in petroleum jelly, a survival space blanket, a red-lensed LED flashlight, a condom for water, and even more 550 cord. Next to that on the belt was his knife, a cold steel ODA. His 20-degree wiggy sleeping bag went into its compartment in the bottom of the pack, and he strapped his dark gray insulite pad to the outside. Everything in the main pack was housed in heavy-duty waterproof bags. In his pockets, he carried a Swiss Army knife, <clears throat> his keys with a small LED light attached, and his wallet stripped of all unnecessary material. He also had a Spyderco knife clip clipped to his right front pocket. He put his custom pack cover <clears throat> in the top pocket of the pack and looked at his load. Well, for all the military stuff he used, he might as well carry an Alice pack, but this pack was so much more comfortable. Oh well, gotta try, he thought to himself. While Dave was busy making preparations, <clears throat> Sandy made phone calls to the police stations closest to her parents' home. They would release no information to her, not even to confirm that her parents were being held. She started calling local emergency rooms and found that her father had been checked and released just a short time before. Sandy immediately called home, and the poor phone service caused her a 20-minute delay. The 20 minutes seemed like a lifetime to Sandy. Mom, are you okay? It's me, Sandy. Sandy blurted when her mother answered. I'm okay, dear. They arrested your father last night and took me in as a material witness. I refuse to say anything, dear, not even a yes or a no. They questioned your father the whole time and told him he could be picked up again at any time. He's upstairs taking a bath. Mom, pack your stuff and come up here. Dear, your father wants to fight this in the courts. Mother, the courts are a lost cause, can't you see? How much pressure can Dad take? How much can you take? The next time, they might not let you go so soon. You could be held for weeks. Sandy, I know it seems bad, but we'll be okay. They spoke for a few more minutes, and then the call was disconnected. Dave told his wife, I'll leave right now. I will basically kidnap them if I have to, but I should be back tomorrow afternoon if all goes well. 
What if it doesn't? asked Sandy, now looking like she regretted Dave's leaving. I can walk home if I have to, and we'll be in touch. I have my radio. After tearful goodbyes with Sandy and the kids, Dave headed his wife's Subaru south. Dave felt like he did before a parachute jump. Excited, apprehensive, and he would never admit to himself a little bit afraid.